heart failure. This is a very important topic, and it's a topic I like a lot because everything makes a lot of sense. And I want to show you why and hope you can understand it too. So heart failure, there's two types. Your heart can fail by either failing to pump. We term this hy systolic heart failure, or also huff rough. Sorry. Huff rough, which we'll talk about later. Okay. Or the heart can fail to relax and fill. It's called diastolic heart failure. That's because the heart fill normally fills during diastole. We term the other one systolic heart failure because that's when the, the heart normally pumps during systole. So there's, those are two types of ways the heart can fail. But your symptoms are going to be the same. Your symptoms, depend whether it's systolic or diastolic heart failure. But your symptoms, though, will depend on whether it's the left side of the heart that fails or the right side. Okay, so uh, let's go talk about symptoms first. And let's, let's talk about the left side of the heart. So when the left ventricle is not, is not pumping well, when the left ventricle has failed, where is the blood going to go? Well, it's not going forward because your left ventricle is not pumping well. So the blood actually backs up into the pulmonary veins. Okay, so we're talking about the left ventricle here, and it's going to back up. So this is the problem here. This is the problem area in left heart failure. You have blood backing up into the pulmonary veins, and you have increased pulmonary pressures. So the symptoms we can all we can just understand from this. The symptoms are just going to be respiratory symptoms. What are they going to be? They're going to be orthopnea. Orthopnea is a fancy term for shortness of breath when you're lying down, when you're supine. Why does this happen? It happens because when you're standing up, you have gravity um, pushing the heart, the blood away from the uh, resist like gravity, which is decreasing the venous return of the blood to the heart. When you lie down, that gravity goes away. So now you have increased venous return of blood. And that venous return is going to go to go to the heart, and it's going to and it's going to build up in the heart, and you're going to get shortness of breath. That's why you'll see a lot of heart failure, failure patients. What they're going to do is they're going to be sleeping on the couch, or they'll they'll be sleeping sitting up because when they can't sleep when they're lying down because they get short of breath. Next one is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, another fancy term, basically meaning waking up gasping for air at night. And this is the same idea. When you're lying down, you have increased venous return to the heart, and you, the other thing you have is you have re reabsorption of peripheral edema. And all that extra venous return in the heart leaves, to, leaves you not breathing well, and so you're going to wake up gasping for air. Other thing that happens is pulmonary edema and shortness of breath. And that's because you have your, um, your pulmonary veins, they have increased pressure. So that pressure is going to push out, so you're going to have fluid, and you have alveoli here. So the fluid's going to go into the alveoli, and it's, that's called pulmonary edema. Okay, and what you can also see here is you can have see something called hemosiderin laden macrophages in the alveoli. And why does that happen? Because you have all these red blood cells in your alveoli, and they're going to break down. They're going to become hemosiderin, and your macrophage is going to eat them up and clean it out. And then you have hemosiderin laden macrophages, and those are termed heart failure cells. So that's a term you might want to know too. Okay. Finally, we have activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And this is actually due to the poor blood flow. So this blood flow goes down. So you have decreased renal perfusion. And what do we talk about? Remember we said that each of our organs has auto, a lot of them have autoregulation. The kidney room, we said that has that too. Remember what cells is involved in that? Remember it's the JG cells, the juxtaglomerular cells. They're going to sense that decreased blood flow because the heart's not pumping forward. And so what's going to happen is they're going to activate their RAS um, system. That's going to lead to fluid retention and it's going to lead to vasoconstriction. And that initially helps. It preserves, uh, you, you know the idea, it preserves blood flow to your organs, to your forward organs. However, you're going to get increased fluid retention. And that's a bad problem because you're already having fluid retention in your lungs causing problems and you're just going to exacerbate your problems. So that's it for the left heart failure. I just Again, I just want to emphasize, emphasize, you can understand all the symptoms based on the physiology because blood backs up into the pulmonary veins causing all your symptoms. Right heart failure is the same idea, except for it's the right heart failing. So the blood backs up where? Into the veins of the body. So it backs up into here and here. And the other, one, the other thing I want to add is that the most common cause of right ventricular failure is left heart failure. 
Because what do we say? Remember we said the left heart failure, um, we have increased pressure in the lungs. So that's increased pressure that the right ventricle has to pump against. And eventually it's going to pump too much. It's going to hypertrophy, hypertrophy. And if you've ever seen a bodybuilder, you'll understand this. If you see a very, really jacked bodybuilder, they're not very functional. They have so much muscle, but it's not very functional muscle. And it's the same idea with this heart. The right ventricle is going to get super buff, and it's, but it's going to lose its function. It's going to pump very poorly. So now you have blood back up into your systemic veins. So what's going to happen? You're going to get jugular venous distension. There's veins in the neck that distend because there's too much fluid in there. And you get hepatosplenomegaly because the veins in your, in your liver and your spleen get distended. So your, your liver and spleen themselves get extra large. And it's due to blood, a back of the blood into the portal venous system. Finally, you're going to get peripheral edema. That's venous co congestion in the peripheral veins, especially in your legs. And what happens here is the same idea. You have increased pressure in the veins, um, increased pressure. So it's going to shoot out into the interstitial. So that's just the space around the veins. And you get fluid here, and that's edema. Okay, that's peripheral edema. That's what you see here. So again, it's very elegant. It's just blood backing up because the heart can't pump forward. And that's going to cause all your symptoms. Now we just talked about how we have symptoms. We're going to talk about the, the basic underlying physiologies where we said systolic heart failure, which was this one because failure of pumping. And another term for this is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, huff rough. There's actually minute differences, but for step one purposes, you just think of them as the same. Now huff rough is due to impaired contractility or increased afterload. Either you're not contracting well, so the heart's pumping less, or there's increased afterload, which is resistance to the heart pumping, which again decreases the amount that's pumped out. So ejection fraction, you already know from the name, reduced ejection fraction, ejection fraction is reduced. And so what's gonna happen to end diastolic volume? Well, if you're gonna pump out less, then there's gonna be less blood remaining left over in the heart, and when it fills it again, your end diastolic volume will then go up. Okay, so symptoms, treatment. First of all, what do we say our symptoms are from? Those from vascular congestion. So we can treat symptomatic symptoms by, I just said the same thing twice. We treat symptoms by decreasing the vascular congestion. And you do that with salt restriction because remember that sodium is how, what causes us to retain fluid. So you restrict the salt you give them diuretic medications. Diuretic medications could include thiazides and loop diuretics. And these medications basically cause your kidney to filter, out, filter and excrete out more fluid. So you basically decrease the volume in your system. Now long-term treatments to decrease mortality will be inc including ACE inhibitors and ARBs, which are angiotensin receptor blockers. And these improve cardiac remodeling, so it helps your heart pump better. Then you also have beta blockers and spironolactone. Spironolactone is an aldosterone antagonist. Now the other thing, the last thing I want to add is do not give beta blockers an acute decompensated heart failure. And what does that mean? You're in an acute decompensated heart failure when you have new or worsening symptoms. Now you're, you're never going to fix someone's heart failure. Their heart's always going to, once it has poor function, usually it's going to remain poor function. But you can treat their symptoms. You can get them in an asymptomatic state either with the salt restriction or the diuretic medications. And that's when it's compensated heart failure. But if they're in acute decompensated heart failure, they have new or worsening symptoms, you do not give them beta blockers because what do beta blockers do? And beta blockers are going to slow down the heart, work, the heart rate. They're going to slow down contractility. They're basically making the heart work less. But if, if, the, if the heart's not working less, then it's not pumping as well. And then you're going to worsen your symptoms even more. So don't give beta blockers when you're in decompensated heart failure. Now we're going to go to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is huff puff, which is all intents and purposes is diastolic dysfunction. Um, what do we say was the problem in diastolic dysfunction? Remember we said it was the problem with relaxation and filling of the heart. And what that is, that what that is, is basically de decreased compliance. Okay. And it's caused by pathologies that stiffen or, or hypertrophy the heart wall. So what happens here is that ejection fraction is actually normal. There's nothing wrong with the contractility. It's decreased compliance. So that's normal. What happens to our end diastolic volume? Um, this one actually important to know because it's kind of counterintuitive. I always thought that it would be decreased, but it's actually normal. Your end diastolic volume is normal. 
you're able to fill up to a normal amount, but what happens is is the key here is the filling pressures. What happens to the filling pressures if you have decreased decreased compliance, but your um your volume's normal, your filling pressure goes up. Okay, and that's that whole compliance um, equation. Remember compliance. What was that equation equals the change in volume over change in pressure. So if we if our compliance goes down and our pressure if our volume is the same, then the pre the pressure must go up. So that's what happens. And this is the key: this increased left ventricular filling pressure, because that pressure is going to be transmitted backwards, and it's going to increase pressure in either your lungs or your systemic circulation. And so remember, that's pressure increased in the in the circulation. And that's going to cause fluid to go out of the vessels. And you're going to get congestion. You're going to get congestion in the lungs, congestion in the systemic circulation. And that's how you get symptoms in diastolic dysfunction or huff puff. Now, treatment here, symptomatic relief is the same because the same problem is vascular constriction. So you got to get rid of that fluid. Remember how you do that? You give them salt, salt restriction and diuretic medications. Now, for the, uh, the long-term treatment, though, treatment is different. It's treat the underlying cause. There's no place for beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs here. Treat the underlying cause. What do we say was the cause of huff puff? Remember, it's pathologies that stiffen or hypertrophy the heart. And we're going to talk about um, talk more about these pathologies in the next following slides. I just want to emphasize again. If you, you can stop watching here, but I want to emphasize again one more time that heart failure. There's two. T there's two ca underlying causes of heart failure. It's either huff rough. With which is the heart not pumping well, or huff puff, which is the heart not relaxing and filling well. So, those are the two underlying etiologies. But there's also two ways, two types of symptoms you can get, and that depends on which side of the heart fails, whether it's the left side of the heart that fails or the right side of the side of the, of the heart that fails. All right, so that's it for heart failure.